So good morning again, Glory. Um, you know, one of my concerns when we talked about sharing from Ecclesiastes was that we would all walk away depressed, you know, each Sunday. I certainly don't want that to happen, so we're going to hang in there and uh, journey on through Ecclesiastes. You've got a couple more Sundays after today where we're journeying through this book of the Old Testament that we understand basically it was either written by Solomon, the king of Israel, uh, or someone who was writing his name. And many the people who study this and go deep into it, and this is their ministry and their livelihood, most of them would say that this was written by Solomon. And Solomon was the king, King David, uh, the king of Israel. His son was Solomon. And Solomon was known the world over at the time for his wisdom and for his writings and for his wealth. So he was a big time dude. And if you read in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Proverbs, if you read like we are Ecclesiastes, if you read what is called the Song of Solomon, these are all books that are attributed to this wise, wealthy man. Solomon was this king that was living this life doing God's thing. And in time, though, as can happen to us, you know, you're on the right track and he got off track. And a lot of different influences in his life moved him off track. And frankly, he had his eye on God and he took his eye off God. And it began to make things a bit fall apart. So here is Solomon in his older years, we think, trying to pass on wisdom to his son who was going to succeed him as king. Trying to help him to say, here's what I've discovered in life. And if anything, I want you to learn from my journey. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about Solomon trying to make sense of life and the meaning of life, sought it in worldly, earthly wisdom. And he, that left him unsatisfied. You know, basically all that wisdom of the world is like dry old leaves blown in the wind, vapor. And last week, we talked about how he sought it in pleasure. And this guy was really involved in some stuff that just kind of blows your mind. All kinds of things that he thought, maybe this is the answer. If I just leave, live this life of total pursuit of pleasure, maybe this will put things all together for me and show me true wisdom. And it left him a grunting. So today we're talking about another area, and that is work. And so as we start to talk about work, I want to start talking about work by talking about retirement. Um, someday I'm thinking I might retire. I don't know. Um, I certainly hope that I can work until I drop, but uh, I don't know what the future holds for me. God does. But I think it's important to talk about retirement in my mind because as I think about this passage that Solomon was speaking and all the things he's wrestling with and trying to understand, it made me think about something that I've witnessed the last couple of years at our annual conference. All the, all the pastors that are ordained gather every year in Lakeside, Ohio, and we have what's called an annual conference. And really, it's not just pastors. Pastors of churches and laypersons, everybody gets their representatives of every church, and they have this yearly meeting. And at this yearly meeting, all the pastors who've been serving and who are retiring are recognized. Now, Pastor Dan, who I followed as lead pastor here, you sent he and Debbie off in an awesome way. I mean, you guys partied hard for him, and it was great. And if we could beam them in by satellite today, which I guess we could if we had enough money to pay for that. If we were to beam them in by satellite today, they would probably say, smiling, thank you, you guys are so wonderful and awesome, you sent us off well. And I even got to, Sandra and I got to go to the party for Dan and Debbie at Lakeside after the retirement service and did a little party in there and had some of those world famous Denise Hayden cookies. <laughs> So you sent them off well. But as part of the guild, part of the trade union, if you will, part of the gathering of pastors who looks at life, I remember being so struck at that retirement service by something that really kind of shook me up a little bit. I'm thinking about Pastor Dan and other pastors whom I've known. And as you get a little older, you start to know people that are retiring, their friends, and you look at their life of ministry and the work that they've done, how they've had different roles in the life of the church, even in some instances, uh, impacting the whole world in ministry. Leadership roles. And, and you think back to all of the people that they must have counseled and the, the memorial services that they did and the weddings they had and the baptisms they celebrated and all those moments where they had the blood, sweat, and tears of trying to lead a people of faith. Forty-some years in some cases. 
and each of those pastors comes up on that stage and they stand there in the spotlight as someone reads a little summation of their life. And off they walk. It takes about a minute 30 to sum up a person's life. A minute 30. 40 years of blood, sweat, and tears. 40 years of hard work and ministry. 40 years of ins and outs. And in a minute 30, in the midst of their peers and colleagues, it's all something. I guess as I get older, that impacts me more. I think about the journeys that I've been on, and maybe as you think about your life, you can think about all the ins and outs, the highs and the lows, the challenges and the joys of work, whatever that work is. Where, as I am beginning to understand, in the midst of a presidential campaign, anybody else know this? And in the midst of this campaign, we hear all kinds of stuff, but some of which we don't want to hear. Some of it might seem a bit dubious. But it's all happening because we have a two-term president who was retiring. And always the scholars and the pundits and the journalists talk about how a president who is finishing out their term and cannot be elected again, how they are concerned about their legacy. What are they going to leave? What can they do that will be remembered? What will be their keystone act that pulls everything together? How will the history books remember them? And how will the history books remember you? And your life? And the things you do? And frankly, in our world and in our culture, we measure a lot of that by our work. What do we do? Go to a party and somebody says, so what do we do? Work is such a big part of life. I got to tell you, Ecclesiastes Solomon and what he said here kind of makes you scratch your head. He's kind of wondering if it all matters because you do all these things to build a life and it seems like it's just gone. I think one of the things that we might miss is this. Sometimes we hear people talk about work as if it is a curse. And undoubtedly some of us are involved in some work that we'd rather not do. Maybe it's a grind to go in there every day and to deal with whatever it is that we've got to deal with. Some of us find great fun and excitement and joy in what we do. It never seems like we have a day of work. And the original intent that God made is for us to enjoy our work. And if you read in the Bible in Genesis in the early chapters of God creating everything, what God did was place Adam and Eve in the garden with him to kind of be co workers with him, partners with him, and taking care of his creation. Our work was to be on purpose, and it was to have dignity and to, to bring us joy. But as is the case with so many, you read a few pages later, like we talk about often in Genesis 3, things began to fall apart. We forgot to trust God and to believe that God had our best interests in mind. And, and when that happened, then work took this turn. Work became toilsome. It became something that can be anxiety-ridden. You know, Ecclesiastes is talking about something that many of us experience with work. You know, the sleepless nights, wondering if the work's going to be there, wondering if these initiatives that we've undertaken are going to last beyond us, wondering if this business that we have built up is going to last beyond our last breath. What does work mean anyway? I think in some ways it seems for many people that it has become a curse. And so Solomon, Ecclesiastes, uses these words to describe what he's looking at. He talks about the weight of toil, the daily responsibilities that he had to deal with, the hardship and anxiety about sleepless nights, the desire for things not to decay that he's built but wondering if they will. Reminds me of a story that Jesus told about a guy who was doing very well with his agriculture. I guess he probably had the primo green thumb. Had all these crops that he planted. That was his business. And planted these crops and they just kept flourishing and flourishing. Realized that the barns that he had built were not adequate. He better build bigger barns to store all these things that he was working so hard to have. And he builds these barns and he's thinking, here's it. This is the ticket. All I got to do is do this and it will last. It will take care of me. 
I won't have to work another day. I can just sit back and chill, chillax, and everything will be good. And then as Jesus tells the story, he says this, but God said to him, you, are, you fool, you will, you will die this very night. And whose will all this be? Everything that you've worked for. And Jesus concludes it by saying, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. Ah, God. If you noticed in this passage from Ecclesiastes that Nikki read, at the very end, it's like God is brought back in this whole Ecclesiastes story. Last couple of weeks we haven't heard much about God in the reading, but now Ecclesiastes Solomon is saying, wait a minute, there's a God element to all of this life that begins to help things make sense. And what he realizes is that God is above everybody. People that are doing what God wants them to do and people that aren't doing what God wants them to do. <coughs> what we would call a saint and a sinner. doesn't matter. God is over all of them. That we are, in fact, autonomous. Oh, don't hear me wrong. It's not like we're robots for God. But Solomon is saying we are all under God, whether you recognize God or not. That everything we have, everything that we do, happens under the eye of God. And the challenge for us is to trust the giver and not trust in the gift. To trust in the work that we've been given and not believe that by somehow living a certain way or doing certain things, better said, we will somehow create immortality. And so God begins to chip away in Solomon's mind here. He begins to see that God is a source of wisdom, the source of wisdom and knowledge and joy. That God is the one who oversees everybody. It reminds me of a story that I heard about a guy named Brother Lawrence. He wasn't always known as Brother Lawrence. He actually, I think his name was Herman, was his given name. And he grew up some centuries ago in France. He grew up in poverty. And so what he decided to do was to join the army. And that way he could get a meal and he could have a roof over his head and clothing. And so he joined the army and he served and apparently had those basic needs met. And then one day he was out in the midst of winter and he saw this tree that was bare. It, it's kind of like if you go out here today and watch your step <laughs> on the ice. But if you go out and you look and see those trees, that are barren of everything, just these gray, craggly things sticking up into the sky. And Herman saw that, and as he looked at that, something began to stir within his heart and soul. He realized that that tree kind of represented him. He had felt barren and empty, but as he looked at that tree, he knew and he trusted that spring was going to come. And there would be leaves coming on that tree, and there would be fruit on that tree. And God began to show him that that was his life. That even though he was in this difficult time and in this barren time of life, that God was going to bring forth something in and through him. It changed his whole outlook on life and everything. He realized that God was reaching out to him, and he wanted to reach back. And so what he did was, believe it or not, he entered a monastery decided to go to a place where he could devote himself in some way to serving God. And you know what they did when he got to the monastery? They put him in the kitchen. Now here's this dude on fire from, for God, wanting to serve, and they put him in the kitchen. They didn't put him in charge, they put him in the kitchen. So what's he doing but washing pans, scrubbing pans, dealing with the bread that's being baked? Dealing with the outrageous demands that people might make of him. Dealing with the frustrations when the dough's not rising. When the water doesn't get hot. When things overflow. But he toiled away in that understanding that as he was doing that, God was working in and through his life. In fact, he says some really pretty cool things. Because he understood that even common tasks were significant. Even the things that the world looked on is not a big deal. You know, not the kind of stuff that people would build monuments for. Even that kind of stuff was significant in the eyes of God. And so he said this. Common business is the medium of God's love. He said further that the, the, the issue is not the worldly status of us or the things we do, 
but our motivation behind it. And he said this, it is not needful that we should have great things to do. We can do little things for God. I, I turn the cake that is frying on the pan for love of him. And that done, if there is nothing else to call me, I bow and worship before God who has given me grace to work. And afterwards, I rise happier than a king. Happier than a king. From flipping a flapjack. But it was all because of how God had transformed him and his understanding of the work that he was doing. See, Brother Lawrence has a book attributed to him of his writings and sayings. It's one of the Christian classics. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. Oh, it took him discipline to see the world this way. It wasn't just like all of a sudden, in a snap of a finger, his work, his toil, his frustrations was suddenly transformed that, oh, this is all God stuff. He worked through it and he struggled with it. But he got to the point in his life where even if he couldn't see the fruit of his labor, he understood that it was an assignment from God. And that changed everything. And my challenge for you this day is can you see your work, whatever it is, as an assignment from God? And can you be at peace with that? Not worrying about the legacy not worrying about what others will say about you. Not worrying about if this will last decades from now and have my name all over it. Can you simply rest in a belief that whatever it is I put my hand and my mind and my heart to, I'm going to dedicate that to God and allow it to be holy work for Him. It was only when Lawrence, Brother Lawrence, reconciled himself to the thought that his struggle and longing was his destiny, that he found peace in life. Now I know that some of us are in hard roles in our work. And maybe you're in a place that you don't want to be. And so it might be a challenge to see this as long as you're doing it as an assignment from God. But there might be something that God wants to do in and through you in that situation. And you may be living a life trying to build a company or, or to build a business. To create some legacy that you hope is going to last for many, many years. And somehow people will still be talking about you years from now. And I invite you to consider what if, in either of those cases and everything in between, what if. You saw what you do each and every day as part of God's assignment for your life. What if you began to see and to ask, how can I serve God in my work today? I think it will change everything. I think it could change everything. And you might be amazed and how that transformation impacts the people around you. When you see your work, not as something that has to be remembered 50 years from now, but as something that in this moment is an offering for God. We pray with you. Holy Lord, so here we are, thankful for the break. Some of us probably are heading back to work later. Maybe some of us are just getting off work. Maybe some of us start into a new week tomorrow. Oh God, help us to give it a trial run at least of seeing our work as a mission from you. To know that it doesn't matter what the world might say. It doesn't matter if we get written up in the paper or have an internet site dedicated to our legacy, but simply to see our lives as an offering to you. Oh Lord, what could that be like? And we pray, Father, for the courage to live it that way. Oh God, transform us, 
transform our work. We pray this in Christ.